your instruments aren't sensitive enough, sensitive enough to tell the difference between the two candidates, well, they say, we can't tell the difference. It's a tie. You're stuck. You can't make a determination. There's no way to tell who won. From a mathematical point of view, the race in Florida, like the race in Minnesota, was too close to call. Even though it looks like a few hundred votes separate these two candidates, those few hundred votes were really an illusion. It's proofiness. Franken didn't win. Neither did Bush. In truth, they tied with their opponents. By coincidence, both Minnesota and Florida use the same procedure in law to determine what happens when there's a tie vote. In the case of a tie vote, the canvassing board shall determine the tie by lot. In other words, you flip a coin. That's right. The proper procedure to determine who won in Minnesota and who won in Florida would have been to flip a coin. It's not a satisfying outcome, but it would have been the right thing to do, and it would have been what the law required. Proofiness becomes more serious than mere elections when it starts affecting our laws. Here's a clip from 12th in Delaware, a documentary about abortion that just came out. A young woman considering an abortion reads a brochure. It is used briefly and then vanishes. It is believed that Ew. it generates new You can get breast cancer from abortion? I don't know that. That's like not cool, that's scary. Here's the brochure. It's entitled, You Have a Right to Know. And it stresses the link between abortion and breast cancer. The problem is, there's no link at all. It's proofiness manufactured by a small group of anti-abortion activists. It has to do with the fact that when women are ill, people who are sick with a disease like breast cancer are more likely to uh, report their entire medical history, including abortions. Control for that effect, and there is no link at all between breast cancer and abortions. Indeed, the claim is explicitly rejected by the National Cancer Institute. However, a number of states have passed laws, ironically entitled right to know laws, which dictate that a woman seeking abortion must be told that abortions cause breast cancer or lead to suicides, which is another bogus claim. Proofiness has become the law of the land. It has even made its way up to the Supreme Court. A few years ago, in a death penalty case, Justice Scalia made an argument in favor of the death penalty based upon the amazing statistics that juries convicted the wrong person very, very rarely. In 10,000 cases, you'd see only two or three wrong convictions. How did Scalia come up with this number? From a back-of-the-envelope calculation performed by a prosecutor based upon the number of felony convictions that had been overturned by DNA evidence. Assume that the number of innocents is understated by a factor of 10, that there were 4,000 people in prison who weren't involved in the crime in any way. During that same 15 years, there were more than 15 million convictions, felony convictions across the country. That would make the error rate 0.027%, or to put it another way, a success rate of 99.973%. In other words, you take the number of people wrongly convicted and divide by the number of people, fel uh, sorry, the people wrongly convicted and divide by the number of felony convictions in the U.S. over 15 years and you get this number. This calculation is very, very wrong. The main problem is that you can't just look at all felony convictions across the country because it's comparing apples to oranges. Most of these felonies never had any chance of being overturned, much less by DNA evidence, in the first place, even if they were wrongful. Most felonies, DNA, uh, 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 most felonies, blackmail, check kiting, and the like, have almost no chance of it at all of being overturned. They're short uh, prison sentences, and you're not going to find DNA evidence of blackmail. Uh, these crimes should not be included in the calculation at all. We're not really talking about all 15 million felonies, though, uh, then, so uh, we're only really talking about rapes and murders. About 600,000 people in the same time period were convicted. But even this is too large a number. Most of these never went before a jury. 
so they never had a chance of being wrongly convicted. Most of these pleaded guilty. So you have to exclude those from the calculation too. And you're left with 80,000. And 4,000 divided by 80,000 is 5%. A better back of the envelope, back of the envelope cal calculation is maybe one in 20 people were wrongly convicted. And in fact, a number of studies using other methodologies say that this is really much closer to the number you expect, about three to 5%. Maybe one in 20 to 30 people are convicted wrongly. And this is where proofiness can get deadly. And it's not just with the death penalty. This is a set of numbers generated by the Pentagon during the Vietnam War. It was supposed to describe how quiet the South Vietnam countryside was. A large number means that there's a lot of turmoil. A small number means that things are peaceful, very under control. This little spike over here is the Tet Offensive, and then it goes down, 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 until 1971, until we pull out. So we're winning the war, winning the war, winning the war, winning the war, bye. Uh, these numbers were nonsense, but they were used to sell the story to the press that we were winning the war the entire time, when in fact we weren't winning at all. And it helped build support for the war. And another deadly uh, case of serious proofiness. Remember when I said I'd come back to this equation? It's a formula for how big an underground nuclear test is. A bomb goes off and the earth shakes. And you plug into this formula the earth, how big the earth shaking is and you get out how big the nuclear test is. In the early 1980s, government officials used this formula to accuse the Soviet Union of cheating on a treaty. This treaty uh, specified that they and we could only test weapons up to a certain threshold, 150 kilotons, about 10 times the size of Hiroshima. And using this formula, they determined that the Soviet Union had set off a number of bombs larger than this limit. President Reagan accused them of violating the treaty and used the violations as an excuse to back out of negotiations about a comprehensive test ban treaty, an agreement that would end all nuclear testing. The problem was the formula was wrong, and they knew it. This formula was the one they used. It was designed for the geology at the Nevada test site, where the US explodes all its nuclear bombs. The geology of the Semipalatinsk uh, region, where the Soviet Union explodes their bomb, is different. So the formula is slightly different. The Nevada formula made it look like the Soviets were exploding huge bombs. Whereas if you looked at the correct formula, used the correct formula, it showed that the Soviets were not. They were abiding by the treaty. Geologists told officials over and over again that they were using the wrong formula. The geologists were pointedly ignored. And as a result, the comprehensive test ban treaty was nuked into oblivion. President Clinton tried to get it ratified, but he failed. President Obama says that the ban is on his list of things to do, but I doubt he'll get to it soon. A subtle little lie, using a slightly wrong formula, derailed a treaty for what might be forever. Proofiness is incredibly powerful and is being used to change your society and alter the course of history. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. What the suggest what your like a loop is? I imagine a lot of speculation could be had about any number, but. I said a lot of men have more sex than women have sex with men. And that would be possible. If men put a lot of where, or like, what would have sex with a lot of men, that would show up in the median, right? Because they'd be all the way at the end. And that could bump their numbers up while women are the same. If you just throw the numbers out altogether, you wouldn't even think that. 
That's, that is absolutely technically correct, that if there is one prostitute on Bleecker Street who is servicing all of America, that yes, it would not show up in the median. However, on the average, it would actually show up. It, supposedly, you'd be able to catch uh, the, the, the promiscuous people. And in fact, the medians should be very close to the averages given what we know about sexual behavior. But you're absolutely right that the median could be slightly different, technically, but it's very unlikely. But to the broader question, uh, what should we do about it? Um, the broader question, I, I think the long-term solution should be education, that people should get a more sophisticated knowledge of what numbers do and what they mean. Uh, of course, this is a little bit of a pipe dream. We're, we're struggling with just getting students to add, subtract, much less do statistics. I think in the short term, the solution is for people, whenever they're presented with a number, just sniff it a little bit. See whether it makes sense. And ask, where did it come from? That little question usually will tell you whether a number is BS or not. 90% uh, of the time, when you're snowed by numbers, it's because the provenance is from a dubious source or the measurement that is being made is a little iffy. So 90% of the time, if you just ask, okay, where did this number come from, you'll uncover shady numbers. I, I made up that 90%. So you're absolutely right. <laughs> And in fact, 76% of the people in this room will believe that 90% statistic. Any other questions? I, I heard a little while back about the, the statistic of the research saying that marijuana kills brain cells and that that research was about that? I don't know specifically about the brain cell killing study. There was one study linked uh, with um, ecstasy uh, ecstasy kills brain cells and in fact it was a mislabeled vial where they were using um, uh, I don't remember what the drug was but something much harder than uh, ecstasy and they actually had to retract the paper as for marijuana I'm not familiar with the study you refer to but I do know that there is a major especially in the mid 1990s there was a major campaign by the government against marijuana and against smoking um, and the conclusion was that marijuana causes you to commit suicide. It causes you to go schizophrenic. Um, the evidence for that is really poor at best and quite probably entirely wrong. So absolutely, there's a lot of deception. And I think that, yes, tobacco is a public health problem. So it's the lies are for a good reason. If you scare people off of smoking, I think society is better off. But it's fundamentally a lie. So my question is about how you find these examples. Um, did you have to... Are they urban legends, more or less, and you sort of stay in that realm for a long, long enough and you'll find them? Or did you have to read a whole bunch of real science to find these bad examples? Well, I've been gathering a file on this for decades. Uh, by trade, I'm a science journalist. And so I deal with studies all the time. And every time there's one that just makes me do a face palm, uh, I put it in my file. Uh, and after, I mean, it doesn't take very long to accumulate these. Um, and in fact, Part of why I went into journalism uh, back uh, in the early 1990s when I started gathering these clips, um, I was studying to be a mathematician. And I was writing on the side. And these things were just annoying me so much that I, I started thinking, I'm, I'm going to have to write about this someday. And then I became a journalist and got the opportunity to actually write about them. Um, and it took me a while to uh, get the book contract, but eventually it, it happened after...